Well, this morning we're talking about God is our refuge and our strength. I'm telling you, this is this is something that we have to we have to hold on to, that we have to truly understand, that we have to remind ourselves on a consistent basis because the enemy doesn't stop. He doesn't stop trying to attack us. He doesn't stop um, trying to get our focus shifted off of the only one who can save us. There's so much in the Word that reminds us who He is. And I don't know if you're anything like me, but I kind of need the repetition. I need the reminders, you know, on a consistent basis. And that's why He tells us to, um, to daily put on the full armor of God. And that full armor, there's so many different facets to it. You know, it's easy to, uh, to forget one here or there. It's easy to forget more than one, actually. But the more that we do it, the more that we're consistent, the easier it is. It becomes part of who we are. It becomes uh, part of our our daily structure. You know, it's and then once you once you've been doing it, to not do it seems weird, seems odd, you know, and you feel it. You see the impact so much more. Whenever you've been, you know, going through life and, and you haven't made it a priority, you can't, really, you can't really tell that difference, you know, because there's not much difference because you're constantly being bombarded. You constantly feel like that you are the only one, that you have to take care of it all on your own, and that's just not the case. But then whenever you start really flowing in that vein, relying on the Lord, relying on the Holy Spirit to get you through every situation, and then you kind of, you miss a day or two or whatever, you know, you, uh, you get busy and stuff, and then you're like, what is going on? What is happening in my life? Why is there so many struggles? And then you're like, oh man, that's right. It's because I've stepped out of that constant communication with him, that constant relationship with him. So no wonder, no wonder the enemy's attacking so hard. No wonder these these attacks are actually penetrating instead of bouncing off the armor like it's supposed to. So we're going to talk about him being our refuge and our strength this morning. He is our refuge and he is our strength. He is. So let's pray real quick. Heavenly Father, thank you, God. Thank you for who you are. Thank you that you love us, you care about us. You want to protect us. You want us to come to you so that you can be our refuge, so that you can strengthen us for the trials and the tasks and the things ahead, Lord. Thank you, God, that you have made yourself completely available for us and that we can come to you any time, that you never leave us, you never forsake us, and you're right there for us, Lord. Help us to remember that, God. Lord, open up our minds today to receive from you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Who knows that trouble comes? It comes. Trouble does come. It comes when you expect it. It comes when you don't expect it, when you least expect it, when you don't want it to. We never really want it to, right? But there's times where we feel like we're more prepared than others. Those times where we feel like that, you know what, I'm, I'm good. I've got it. Things have been going great. It's easy, you know. I'm, I'm doing this. I'm doing this. No, you're not. <laughs> uh, no, you're not. No, I'm not. Troubles do come. John 16, 33 is, is a, a verse that we need to remember. We need to keep it in mind. We need to understand that this is an absolute truth because Jesus told us that it is. John 16, 33, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you so that in me, in me, not in you, not by yourself, but in me, you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulations, but take courage. I have overcome the world. I mean, I could, 
I could live in this verse for ever. You know, it took us two years to get through John. I mean, so, um, but this one verse, this one verse is so powerful. There's so much in here, so much truth. But he promises us, this is Jesus speaking, and he tells us, you're going to have testings. You're going to have trials. You're going to have temptations. These things are going to come. Jesus himself, God, fully God and fully man, Jesus himself, the word says that he was tempted in every single way that we're tempted. Every single way. The difference is he didn't give in to them. And if he didn't give in to them, and we're like, well, I... Why am I constantly giving in to this stuff? Why am I constantly struggling with this? I think a lot of the times it's because of pride. And, you know, we think of pride as this arrogance, this arrogant um, demeanor that people have. They think that they're better than whatever. That's not always pride. That's not, that is always pride, but that's not the only aspect of pride. Pride is believing or thinking that, that, You don't need God, that you don't need help with something else, that you're good enough. Pride comes in lots of different forms, but this this part right here, whenever we are tempted, whenever we're tried, whenever we're going through these trials, and we're trying to do it on our own, how ridiculous is that? How ridiculous am I when I try to do it on my own? Whenever these trials are coming, and I'm like, what can I do? What can I do to make this better? Nothing, except go to Him. Because He says, take heart. I've overcome the world. If He's telling you to take heart, don't stress, don't worry about it, I've overcome the world, that means we have to put our faith and our hope and our trust in Him that He's going to protect us, that He's going to take care of us. That he's going to do it. He doesn't say, take heart because you've overcome the world. He doesn't say, Nathan, don't sweat it. You've overcome the world. He does tell us that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Through Christ Jesus. If we try to find this, this anywhere else, we will fail. Speaking from experience. Look at all the different ways that that these troubles come. Just think about some things that you've dealt with in your own life, with with testings and stuff. And and you know, a lot of times we try to give Satan all the credit that that he's the one that tests us, that he's the one that that has us go through trials. And, And a lot of times it is, man. A lot of times it is. But the Word also tells us that some of these come from God. You know, that's, that's hard, to, hard to think about. It's like, really? Really? But His Word tells us that He does. He does it to refine us, to sharpen us, to strengthen us to help us get where we need to be in order to accomplish the tasks and purposes that He has on our lives. It's just like with our kids. Have you guys ever, uh, those of you with kids, and they're starting to walk, and mom's over here, and dad's over here, you know, and you're, you're holding on to that kid, and they're like, come on, come on, you can do it. That kid might fall down. That kid is going to fall down. Let's face it, they didn't come out of the womb able to walk, but you test them. You test them. You give them a little bit. They don't start all the way over there. They start out right here, you know. Come on, one step and we celebrate like crazy. So does he. Take that one step. Be obedient. Just do what I asked you to do. Just just take this one step and when we do... He celebrates, just like, we. yes, he's posting to his friends on Facebook. Can you believe what my kid just did? This is awesome. He celebrates. 
whenever we overcome trials and tribulations, these temptations. If that kid that's, that's trying to walk, mom's sitting there, come on, come on. And then the kid sees something shiny. <laughs> right? I mean, but whenever they keep their eyes fixed and focused, they have that faith. Mom's right there. Mom loves me. Dad's right there. He loves me. He's going to catch me. And our Father catches us. He catches us. These temptations that we go through, man. Like, you know, think about Jesus as he's out in the wilderness. He's just baptized by John the Baptist, his cousin, who's like, man, I'm not even, I'm not even good enough to untie this dude's sandals. And Jesus said he's the greatest man that's ever lived. And John says, I'm, I'm literally not good enough to untie his sandals. I love how they go back and forth. They, they just love each other, you know? And then heaven splits open and the Holy Spirit descends down on Jesus and it rests on him. He's got the Holy Spirit and immediately it leads him out into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days and 40 nights by Satan himself. We think that just that last little bit that we get to hear about where Satan takes him up on the temple... He takes him and shows him all this. You can have all this. All this is yours. You can have it. You just have to bow down and worship me and it's yours right now because it's been given to me. You gave it to Adam. He gave it to me. It's mine. Mine to give. All you have to do is this one little thing. 40 days without food. 40 days without drink. You take me 40 minutes. I'm, I'm, I'm in a bad mood, you know? Starting to get hangry a little bit. 40 days and nights? But the Holy Spirit had come on him, was with him. Satan tells Jesus, You can command the angels, cast yourself off here if you're really the Son of God. You can command the angels, they'll catch you, won't they? Yes, Satan, you moron, of course they will. He's God, what are you thinking? Yes. But Jesus continues to go back to the Word, back to the Word, back to the Word. He relies on the power and the strength that the Holy Spirit is giving him that's allowing him to be able to withstand the attacks of the enemy. It says every temptation known to man, every temptation, whatever you struggle with, I don't know what's in your head, you don't know what's in my head, but every temptation that I struggle with, he's struggled with it. Every temptation you've struggled with, he struggled with it. And we think we have it hard. We think we have it bad. Probably none of us have been directly attacked by Satan himself. Probably none of us. We give him a lot of credit. But he's not standing right there next to you face to face, eyeball to eyeball. You smelling that nasty breath, it's got to be nasty, you know. Him himself tempting us. And we just write it off like Jesus doesn't know what I'm going through. God doesn't know what I'm going through. Are you kidding me? Am I kidding me? I'm talking to me, you know. Of course he knows. There's nothing that we could ever go through that he hasn't personally gone through. Nothing. These things Jesus tells us so that we can have peace because he's overcome the world. Even if Satan himself is attacking you, even if Satan himself winds up in your bedroom speaking in your ear, we can have peace because he has overcome the world. And we are his. We were bought with a price, the most precious price. His own life, His own blood, His own flesh. He breathed out the very last breath. He gave up him, His soul. The Father stopped looking at Him. He took on every sin, every drop of shame, every sin you've ever done, and every sin 
all the billions of people that have ever done. He took that. That's what we were bought with. That's why he can say, take heart. I've literally overcome it all. Stop worrying. Stop worrying. When you're having these trials, when you're having these temptations come at you, when you're feeling this condemnation and this guilt and this stress and this shame and this fear and this worry, he says, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. Come here. Your kid's worrying because they're getting bad grades. They're worrying because they can't afford their car payment. They're worrying because their relationship's going in the tank. And you say, come here, come here, come here. Let me hug you. Let me love on you. I'll make it all better. I will make it all better. I promise. And he says, come here. Come here. Let me love you. Let me make it all better. Come here. And he wants us to wrap up in his arms. That's why he tells his disciples, don't discourage these little children from coming to me. What were they thinking? <laughs> he wanted to hold on to those kids. They wanted to be with him. He's like, heck, yes. Come here. Come here, kids. You know, because he's thinking, I remember when I made you. I remember when I designed you and I fashioned you. I remember when I gave you your attributes and you to look like what you look like and act like what you act like. I remember this. I remember it. I, oh, and now I get to hold on to you in person. Don't make these kids not come to me. That's why John was able to lean up against Jesus' chest. You know, he got to lean up against Jesus' chest. And, and you know, we, we think from a physical standpoint, some dude's leaning up against his chest. Jesus created him, fashioned him, his skin, his hair, his smell, everything. He fashioned him. He did. And he did to you and me. He knew I wasn't going to grow hair here or here. He's okay with that. You know? Thank you. I got an amen there. All right. I'm going to keep telling that hair stuff. You know, I was reading through Joshua the other day. Joshua, Samuel, Kings, all these. Oh, my gosh. They're so fun. They're so fun. But I'm reading through Joshua, and Joshua, Moses is dead. You know, God tells Moses to anoint Joshua, and Joshua gets to do all these cool things now. And he goes into the promised land with the Israelites, and they're like, they're getting prepared for war. You know, they cross over, and they cross over the river, and they just start wiping everybody out like God told them to, systematically. Because if they didn't, they would be corrupted. They would start worshiping these gods, the Baals and the Asherahs and, and all these, these nasty, horrible gods, right? And he knew that it would cause that, it would rip him away from them. They wouldn't go to him anymore. So they had to be systematically removed. And then... They come up to this place, and God told them to wipe everything out. Take the treasures, the treasures, and, and sanctify them. Give them to me. Just the treasures, but everything else has to be killed. And they do, Joshua thinks. Until all of a sudden, they start losing this battle. First time they'd ever lost. You got to think, these people were slaves for 400 years. And then they just wandered through a desert eating bread and water for 40. He did give them some meat every now and then. But they weren't warriors, but they were straight up warriors. Like he made them warriors. He gave them defeat. He's the one that made them successful in this land. And then all of a sudden, they lose this battle. He, he's like, what is going on here? Why would we lose? And so listen to what Joshua says, what Joshua does. In Joshua 7, verse 6, it says, Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there until evening. It also goes on 
So say that the, uh, the other elders did as well. And listen to what Joshua says, though. He says, Alas, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. You guys don't understand. This land was incredible. It was incredible. It had everything that, that they could need. It provided not only what they needed, but comforts that they hadn't ever had for the past 440 years. And he's saying, why didn't you just make us content to stay over there? You know, there were thousands and thousands of them, and they, they only lost 36 in this battle. They only lost 36 people in this battle, but 36 was way too many. He's like, what's going on here? Then Joshua says, after he's saying, why didn't you make us content to stay over here? He says, he says pardon your servant, Lord. What can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? Now that, I've, now that we've gone into this battle you told us to go into, and now we've been routed, what can I say? The Canaanites and the other people of the country, they'll hear about this, and they will surround us and wipe us out. Our name from the earth will be gone. What then will you do for your own great name? This loss, he's telling God, this loss is going to make you look bad. He's probably thinking it's going to make me look bad, but he's, you know how you, like, you talk and try to make your point. And he's like, this is going to make you look bad even. Your name is great, but here we've lost and we've been relying on you. He was face down in front of the Ark of the Covenant. Listen to how the Lord responds to him here. The Lord said, stand up. What are you doing face down? Then he goes on to explain why he lost, why they lost. He says, Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. Joshua's like, you got to be kidding me. Who was it? Who was it? You know? Then Jesus, God says, that is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and they ran because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. I told you to do this. You didn't do it. You took yourself out from underneath my covering. I didn't take you out from underneath my covering. I told you do this, you did this, you pulled yourself out. I didn't pull you out, I didn't leave you, you pulled yourself out. Then God tells him, but wait, there's more. Go, consecrate the people, tell them, so he tells Joshua to consecrate them, and then he says, tell them to consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. For, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There are devoted things among you, Israel. You cannot stand against your enemies until you remove them. You pulled yourself out. Here's what you can do to get back. You will not be successful until you do this. It's just the way it is. And it's not even a hard thing. All you have to do is consecrate yourself and destroy what I told you to destroy. Isn't it great that he didn't say, you screwed up, you're done. I love that he didn't do that. Gives me some hope. You know, the world tells us that, that we can deal with all these things on our own. Your struggles, your trials, your temptations, you can deal with these things on your own. Just read a self-help book, you know? Just listen to, listen to this guy, and he'll help you out, you know? Or, or if you work hard enough, you can. You know, maybe you need to punish yourself. Discipline yourself, whatever. 
But the Word tells us that He's our strength. He's our refuge. He is our source. He is the one that makes us more than conquerors. People say, look deep in yourself. You know what you're going to find? Junk. You're going to find nastiness. Because deep inside yourself is just nastiness. It just is. Unless you're seeking the Holy Spirit that's within you. God wants us to cry out to Him. We cry out to the Lord and He answers us. He doesn't go hide from us. He's not far off somewhere. He's literally right there. It says that He's standing at the door knocking. Open it, you know. Seek His face. Seek me and you will find me whenever you seek for me with all of your heart. Psalms 142.2 Psalms 142.2 says, I pour out my complaint before him. I declare my troubles before him. This is King David. If anybody had some struggles in life, everybody being against them is King David, you know? And he's telling us. And God says, David is a man after my own heart. He's after my own heart. And here's why. He knows he can't do any of this stuff on his own. So he pours out his struggles to the Lord. He declares it to the Lord. He makes it known to him. Psalms 34, 17 says, The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and rescues them from their troubles. I love that. You know, the Word talks about how we stumble, we fall. The Word says that, that a righteous man falls down seven times and gets back up. That's what makes him righteous. The righteous right here cry out to God. A righteous person isn't righteous because they do everything right. They're righteous because they know they can't be righteous without Him. They know they'll never be righteous without Him. They know they cry out to Him whenever they've fallen down and they're hurt and they feel miserable. They cry out to Him. And it says, and they get back up. No matter how many times they fall down, they get back up. He helps them up. You know, the Word says that He holds you up with His mighty right hand. He does. So we're not even having to get ourselves back up and brush ourselves off. It's like your kid that you're teaching how to ride a bike and they fall down and they're crying and you go and you pick them up and you, you brush them off and, and you comfort them and make sure they know they're okay, it's okay. And then you put them back on the bike. You don't say, don't worry, you'll never have to ride a bike again. No, of course not. Because you know how fun riding a bike is. Take it off some killer jumps, man. Come on, let's do it. John 16, says, These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. He's wanting us to come to Him that we will have the trials, we will have the tribulations, but He's overcome. And if we just simply come to Him, if we just simply cry out, He will be our refuge. Refuge means to flee from, or to flee for protection, to confide in, or to put one's truth in. Now, if you look up, refuge and like the Webster's Dictionary, it doesn't go that deep into the details, but if you look the word up in the Greek, that's exactly what it means. To flee for protection, to confide in, and to put one's truth in. That's what he's saying whenever I'm your refuge. You can flee to me. You can confide in me. You can tell me anything because he already knows. He literally already knows. You know, we try to, we don't want to tell him everything because we feel bad and we know it's gross. And he's like, I was there. <laughs> I saw it. You know, like I saw what you did. I still am here though. I still love you though. I love that we sang Firm Foundation. Such an awesome song. It says, he won't fail. He won't fail. You'll probably fail at multiple things. I know I have. I know I will. But he won't. He won't. Proverbs 30, verse 5 says, Every word of God is pure. It says, He is a shield. 
to those who take refuge in him. He's a shield. You know, we don't think a whole lot about shields these days because our military doesn't necessarily go out with a shield strapped onto their left arm. They do wear body armor. They do roll around in up-armored vehicles that have armor on them. That is a shield. You know, it's just like getting into an armored personnel carrier. It's like crawling under the wing of the Almighty God. The enemy can sit there and take shots at you all day long, but it's going to go bing, 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 bing. It's pretty cool to get shot at in an up-armored vehicle knowing that nothing's going to happen. <laughs> like, keep it coming. <laughs> you know? That's what he does for us. It's so cool. 2 Samuel twenty two thirty one 31 says, As for God, His way is blameless. The word of the Lord is refined. He is a shield to all who take refuge in Him. Psalms 4, 8 says, In peace I will both lie down and sleep for you alone, Lord, have me dwell in safety. Have me dwell in. That means abide in, to live in. You have me live in safety. And people are like, oh, cool. That means that nothing bad's going to happen to my flesh. No, that's not what that means. Dwelling in and abiding in Him is protection for your soul. God says, don't worry about things that can, can kill this flesh. He literally tells us, don't worry about the things that can kill this flesh. What can kill this flesh? Somebody physically wanting to harm you, starving to death, freezing to death. All the things that we have to have, right? If you get trapped out in the middle of nowhere, you have to have water, food, shelter, clothing. If you don't, they can kill your flesh. God says, don't worry about that. What you need to worry about is what can kill your soul. Because this flesh, it's going to die. It's going to be destroyed eventually anyway. Some of us sooner than others. Some of us later than others. But we all have the same outcome. This flesh dies. Don't worry about that. He says, I'm going to take care of everything that you need here. That's not a big deal. Worry about what can kill your soul. That's what you've got to worry about. But this says that He alone, He alone, the Lord alone is what allows us to dwell in safety. That means you can prepare as much as you want. You can store up as much money as you want. You can have every single need taken care of here. But He's the one that allows you to lie down in safety. Even all of King Solomon's wealth disappeared. It was gone. Nahum 1.7, I love this. It says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. The Lord is a stronghold in the day of trouble. And He knows who... Take refuge in Him. He knows them. He knows them. People go, they go to seek to find themselves. You don't need to find yourself. You need to find Him. He knows you. And you don't even need to know yourself. You just need to know that He knows you. Because the Word tells us to be crucified with Christ. That it's no longer I who lives, but it's He who lives in me. Isn't that great? I mean, it sounds kind of bad, but it's, if you break it down, it's great. It's really great. Because it's like, I don't have to do this. I don't have to do it on my own. I don't have to do anything on my own. He does this. I mean, you got to take you know, care of yourself so you can accomplish His tasks and purposes. But He's going to if you're submitted to Him. Here's how he does it. He's our refuge and strength. Doesn't really matter how strong you are unless he's your strength. Samson 
could kill thousands of people, rip literally these giant gates off of the hinges in the middle of the night and carry them up this hill and set them down over there. Like he could push buildings down, literally. He could not be conquered. But that was because of God's strength. As soon as that head was shaved, done. Anybody could conquer him. Anybody. The Holy Spirit is the one who enables us, who strengthens us to live according to what Jesus commands. Jesus says, if you love me, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. Right after that, it says, and this is my command, to love one another. And then whenever he's bringing Peter back, because Peter just totally dropped the ball, right? And we want to blame Peter, so would you, so would I. We would have all dropped the ball. That was the plan. But Jesus is bringing him back. And he says, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Then feed my lambs. If you love me, this is how you're going to show me. Feed my lambs. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then take care of my sheep. This is how you're going to show me that you love me. This is how you're going to be able to to show me. You've been beating yourself up. You've been stomping all over yourself because you failed. You heard the rooster crow and you're like, oh my goodness, how did I do that? And you just haven't given, you haven't forgiven yourself. This is how you can do it. Take care of my sheep. Take care of my sheep. And then he says, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. You know I do. Yes, I know you looked at me when that rooster crowed. And it didn't hurt anybody as bad as it hurt me. But you know that I love you. He says, yeah, I know. I know you do. I know you do, and I love you too. Now feed my sheep. This is what you're going to do. This is how the rest of your life is going to be devoted to me. You're going to feed my sheep. You're going to take care of my sheep. You're going to feed my lambs. Peter says, even if I have to die with you, I'll never deny you. Jesus says, you're going to die for me. You are going to. but I want you to live for me before that. And by living for him, by living for Jesus, that's what got Peter killed. And all the other disciples except for John. But John was tortured and tormented too. Even so much so that he had to watch all of his other friends be tortured and tormented and murdered. That's pretty bad. But when Peter is getting ready to be murdered, he's going to be crucified. He's literally being crucified like Jesus was crucified. Jesus says, yeah, you're going to die for me. Peter had no idea it was going to be literally the same way Jesus was. And Peter loved Jesus so much and knew that he wasn't worthy To die the same way Jesus did. He said, wait, I know being crucified is bad. It it really does stink. But I don't deserve to die in the same manner as my Savior. Would you crucify me upside down? (sighs) Holy cow. What? He was nailed to a cross and hung upside down because he didn't feel worthy to die in the same manner that Christ did. That's the life that Peter led after this. He found his strength in God, in Jesus, in the Holy Spirit, to walk out exactly what God told him to walk out. 
you're going to die for me. I need you to live for me. I want you to live for me, and I know that you love me so much that you want to live for me. This is how we're going to do it. And he did. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, in the flesh, I live by faith. I can't live it any other way. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. That's incredible. We all know Philippians 4.13, right? It says, I can. And when you're hearing me say it, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. You can't do all things through you who gives you strength. But you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. And He tells us. It's right here. It's His Word. It's absolute truth. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. He's working in you and through you because it brings Him pleasure. John 17 says Jesus is praying and He literally says that we have glorified Him. That we've glorified Jesus. That we are the glory of Jesus. He does these things in us and through us because we bring Him pleasure. Guys, that ought to get you fired up. That ought to let you know that you can go to Him. You can ask Him to help you. You can ask Him to, to do these things in you and know that He will. Because it gives him pleasure. It literally gives him pleasure. There's one verse that I didn't get on this thing. Let me see if I can find it. John 14. 16 through 17. Let me look it up real quick. I love this verse, man. John 14, 16 through 17. <laughs> this is Jesus speaking. And I will ask the Father... And he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He's the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot conceive him. Because it isn't looking for him. And it doesn't recognize him. But you know him. Because he lives with you now and later will be in you. Jesus says, no, I will not abandon you. I'm not going to abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Isn't that incredible? Jesus says, I will pray to the Father for you. I'm going to pray to the Father for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Guys, we have to remember that no matter what we're going through, no matter how many times we fall, He's right there. Because He loves us so much. He's not going to abandon us. He's not going to say, nope, that was one too many. You know, uh, I know I didn't tell you exactly how many you had, but that last one, that was it. No. That's not what He does. It's really not. He's that good Father. We can always run to him. He's always our refuge. He's always our strength. And it says he's our ever-present help in our time of need. Let's pray.
Mm. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this awesome purpose and plan that you've laid out for us. Thank you that you don't leave us. Thank you that you're right here with us, Lord. Thank you that you protect us and you're our shelter and we can run to you and cry out to you and know that you hear us. And thank you, Jesus, that you literally pray to the Father for us. And thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit to help us and lead us and guide us into all truth. We recognize that we can't do this on our own. Yeah, we've tried. And no, it doesn't work. And thank you, Lord, that you make a way where there is no way it's not possible for us except through you. God, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. Help us to remember you're right there for us, Lord, in everything, God, even in our darkest hour. The light shines in the darkness, and that darkness cannot even comprehend it. That's who you are, God. Lord, I pray that you'll go before us today, that you'll prepare our way for us, God, like your word says that you will. Help us to trust you. Help us to take you at your word, God, and help us to bring glory and honor to your name with everything that we do, Lord. Thank you for redeeming us and making us your child, your children, God. Keep us humble and pure-hearted, God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.